Hello, sir. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the show. Welcome to Torn Tuesday. Uh, we are live at Scum and Villainy. Oh, and there's and no yes, one here because we are we are quite live here. We're we're live, but there's yeah, nobody here villainy. except Ec us hobbitses. And um, the secret legions of house elves that work at Hogwarts and keep everything going. There's the Dobby. There is the secret legion. Gollum. There are legions of house elves Th at literally Scum and Villainy. There's a Dobby if no one in knew, the corner. I let, I let it out. The secret is out. There's a there's a Smeagol in the corner. <laughs> there's a Dobby, and right behind you, yes. there is a Smeagol. Is and you can tell by the look on his face. That's a definitely a, is a groggy. That's not a golem. That's definitely a Smeagol. That's definitely can, a Smeagol. You can definitely tell. Yes. Yeah. Hey, let's have Grogu. Uh, no, it's Grogu. Let, let, let's, let's have Grogu join the show. Okay. Here. Yeah. Of course. Here's Grogu. He's coming. Because actually, he spends most of his time trying to get the frogs' eggs that are here in the in the blue in milk the, in, in, the, in blue the blue water. Yeah, it's insane. It's wonderful here. That's right. Uh, hello, everybody in the chat room. I'm t I'm looking at the chat right now. You can see my laptop on the table. Uh, Vicky, hello, Jill, Julia, Princess Toy Nerd, um, Danny Bites is like O M G Grogu, uh, Cecilia, Tammy, Timo, Let's Roll. Hel hi, hi, little guy. Hi, little guy. Hot, what's you up, buddy? You got a little, little fuzz on the top. He does have a little bit of fuzz. This is the life-size 1-1 one one replica from Sideshow. This, this is the 1-1. One one. This is it. It's true. And it's true. It, is the Smeagol in the corner 1-1? One one? Mm, I would venture to say yes also. That is true. Yeah, yeah I think so. It, it's actually true. That, that would be a scale model golem. I would believe so. This yes. is the legendary... One to one, actual full replica, not replica, <laughs> clone. This is a, the, the official clone. Oh, that's part of, of Star Wars fan theory. There's some hardcore fan theories going on about whether the Kaminoans from Kamino did, did, did a have, did a have any cloning interests in the child. That's right. Grogu. I wonder. Everybody's joining we don't the know. chat. Hello, Janice but and Julia and Kay and I'm Amy and I'm Julia. Hello, everybody. I'm watching the chat here. Uh, it is Sir Ian McKellen's 82nd birthday. I was going to say we must start off celebrating that birthday of we're that gonna, man. We're, we have we so many celebrate. stories to tell because, Cliff, you used to work with Ian McKellen. Uh, in a, back in the day, yes. So I you've got at some stories. I think everybody wants to hear some stories. Uh, I would love to tell a good, fun, and very gentle little story about Ian. So He's my first, qu but my but my question is, we've got Grogu here with us. Hi, Grogu. Um, How you doing? He doesn't really talk that much, but Cliff, I want to say hello to all the people in the YouTube chat. And are you speaking to people on all the other platforms? Yeah, I'm seeing I can everybody. See them right here. The hello. Guinea Bean says greetings from Cardiff. Hello, Cardiff. Now the qu question I have for you, Cliff, is. Is Grogu younger than Gandalf? Ooh, no. I don't know. Wait a minute. No, don't corner me on this. But if I'm to assume Grogu's lifespan, he would be much, much younger than Olorin. Because Olorin, who became Gandalf, the Maiar spirit that eventually became one of the five Istari. Yeah. That Olorin was thousands of years older than our little Grogu. But that's not to say the lifespan of Yoda's and, and Grogu's species. I mean, the lifespan of their species is... Is Yoda older is than Mithrandir? Insane. Is Yoda older than Mithrandir? Chat room? Chat room, that's the question I would the venture. I w my instinct is to say no. That Yoda might be a few centuries younger than Mithrandir. If you're talking only the time of when Gandalf or Mithrandir showed up first. In, so in, and not the way that any studio that remains unnamed, not, we're not talking about some TV show that's coming up, but in the books themselves, the way, in the books themselves, Yoda. the way that J.R.R. Tolkien wrote them, the Istari show up at a very certain time on the calendar. They show up in the third age. That's when they appear. Okay. okay. So, so, so let's get that straight. We must get the that straight. The chat room has, has, has answered the uh, first question, Cliff. Um, Grogu is about 50 years old, what make, which makes Grogu the same age as Bilbo when he left on his adventure and the same age as Frodo when he left on his adventure. Kismet. It's always 50 years. 
It's 50, 50 years is and the, I, magic, I want, the magic Grogu number. I wonder it's if the 50. writers of, 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 the, magic of Bilbo the Mandalorian <laughs> chose 50 years old for Grogu on purpose. It's because a, 50 is the homage. new 30. That's why. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Torn Tuesday. It is so good to have you here. Mr. Justin over here introduced the show, and he's the, the producer and the button lever. You know, he's the, you know, Yzma who's back there shouting at Kronk, wrong lever! You know, but he's, <laughs> he's, he's always pulling levers, and I'm the one up here front and center usually talking to, to you folks. And welcome again to our worldwide Clip audience. The, the welcome to the OneRing.net, our Torn Tuesday show. Begins with a unique we're Star Wars flair because tonight. We're, we're, we're back you. at Scum and Villainy yes, uh, today. Yes. Uh, we're going to switch off we because I, I, feel like, I feel like I enjoy the intimacy of the Zoom um, format of the show where you know everybody's face is on s on camera and we can we can bring people in. I don't know about you guys in the chat, but I I, I love that format. But it's good to break up the monotony and <laughs> be here with you. You're vaccinated. It is it's great. Yes, I've been fully vaccinated, I'm vaccinated since as well. since March. Yes, actually for a couple of months now. I've been thank fully goodness vaccinated. for living in L.A. If you guys are having trouble getting your vaccine, get on a plane, get in the car, get to L.A. No questions asked. You can get poked. Right in the arm, and and <laughs> that is that's what's going on you in LA. You can get poked within 20 minutes of arriving within the city of Los Angeles. Now, uh, Cliff, <laughs> I it, it, it sounds as funny as it really is. I'm sure. Hey, you know what? Uh, you know our regular Andrew Laubacher in the chat. Yes, room? Andrew. One, yes, one of our uh, dear uh, family members in the in the live chat. Well, I'm happy to report he is in the chat room saying happy birthday, Ian. B today is his spouse's and his 19th wedding anniversary. Oh, hello. Happy anniversary. An, an, a wedding anniversary. Many blessings to you. You and your, uh, uh, your better half, Andrew. That's fantastic. Well yes. done. Yes, congratulations. Well done. Well done. Congratulations. Well done. Um, Julia says, uh, BTW last week's show was so good. What, what, did we do last, what did we do last week? I forget. All, all of the shows kind of blend together. Um, We've had some great shows in the last few Ooh, weeks. This my, my recent show was great. Oh. My personal favorite was your conversation with the New Zealand Symphony Orchestra to hear those stories of the first <laughs> people to perform so the to notes. The, what the musicians and, uh, <laughs> and I was oh my thrilled. gosh, that I was, was great. And, and enthralled with like just just the the mechanics of of m music. Oh my gosh. <sighs> Oh my gosh, it was so, 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 so great to have these conversations collectively. We recently spoke with Henry Mortensen and his father, Vigo Mortensen. Wow, wow, what a <laughs> life, uh, what, what a dream. We, we, we recently spoke with these extraordinary musicians who were the first people on earth to bring breath and life to Howard Shore's music through, right. th through their own very breath from their own lungs. These instrument players, uh, these extraordinary musicians, have a career playing some of the greatest composers on earth. And then suddenly, one day, they didn't know it, but they get booked on this movie score job. And they're given this Howard Shore music. It's amazing. Well, it's just absolutely I, I, amazing. The, w the, the thing I took away from that conversation is we learned that... Um, Howard Shore would spend m uh, minutes and minutes and minutes and minutes of very expensive studio time talking with about lore <laughs> with, with hundred <laughs> hundreds of people yes. that are on the clock. Yes, yes, absolutely. And and uh, you know you know my big takeaway from the New Zealand Symphony Orchestra conversation, which you can check out on our YouTube and Facebook page, um, Is it possible? the Lord of the Rings Orchestra conversation was, it's very expensive to do music at that level. Indeed it is. And the, my actual takeaway is that we are privileged as fans to have Amazon with their unlimited deep pockets willing to commit whatever it takes. And Jeff has said, Jeff Bezos has said, whatever it takes to make this show right. Mm -hmm. And the fact that no other TV show has ever afforded an orchestra at the level that Lord of the Rings did Th there's a chance that we could Indeed. get... It's worth repeating. We, it's worth we can get some great music because of the budget. It's worth, it's worth repeating that some of the best music that you heard 
even if it was on a show as big budget as The Dark Crystal, Age of Resistance, that was still a keyboardist, the composer himself creating a lot of sounds on a keyboard with the uh, most amazing advanced programming and synthesizers, which is why even people like Hans Zimmer have dabbled into this extra side wave of musicianship. And I'm not knocking on electronic musicianship compared to having, you know, a 62 huge piece orchestra. I'm not talking about the difference in, in terms of that one being more valid than the other, but there is a difference in the sound. Dan in the There's chat room There's a difference says in the sound and the organic quality of having music of that scale with those various different and instruments. And redoing every take to picture and not like chopping yes. and editing. Dan yes. in the chat room says music goes overlooked nowadays. I agree with you. Uh, it, this is the first time that the cost of the musicians and, and notice the musicians weren't like we're expensive. Like, no, no, they're here to do a job. Right at, Indeed. at at musicians' yes. rates and whatever. So, I'm I'm I, I don't know. It was the first time I've ever felt like I thank goodness it's Amazon's deep pockets doing Lord of the Rings, from the music alone. Thank goodness. Oh, so you we can be as cynical as we want about the fact that there is a sort of a corporate approach to this ki time kind of production. It's a little bit different than what we've experienced before right. in terms of the way the other six films were made, especially with the, the Lord of the Rings was made much much like a, in the spirit of an independent film in, in a faraway country, quote unquote, at least from our limited That's Western right. perspective. But now here we go looking at, we can knock all we want and be as cynical as we want about Amazon Studios uh, you know, being uh, you know, perhaps corporate in their approach to producing this thing, but we cannot be cynical about those deep pockets giving extra resources in a physical sense, in a real palatable, Th this is the tangible, these are tangible assets. That and cost money. That cost, these are boots on the ground yep. that cost money. These are elements of weapons and clothing and design and physical props that they can build on sound stages. That costs money. That's so right. there's a lot of this tactile stuff, including the music itself, which does, I agree with you on that in spirit, I agree it does stand to benefit from those deep, endlessly deep pockets, it, it seems. So the other conversation that we deep. had uh, at right after the New Zealand Orchestra is, Cliff, you home-runned that billion dom madness on uh, Star Wars well Day, guys, May the 4th. Did, let me ask you guys out there in the, in the chat, did you enjoy our little billion dom conversation about the friendship onion? And we got to learn so much about what to expect from those two because they're now going to populate the, the, the very, very big marketplace of podcasts now with some humor and some, and some humanity. I listened to the first some episode. Real Did humanity. you in the chat listen to the first episode? It's out now. now the oh, it is out now. The first episode is out episode already. Episode two came out today, so you can listen oh, to yes, the first that's right. and second episode. I listened to the first one. They tell stories about the Apple scene. The second breakfast scene. <laughs> they 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 tell the story of how cold it was that day, and it was you know it was in the middle of winter, and you know it's oh, like, oh we got to so come great. up with a joke right now, and you know all the, uh, the, the, <laughs> the, 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 the and then they eat then they eat a Twinkie for the first time. Oh my God! Yes, they actually so talk the podcast, about that. The, the oh, Billion so Dom great. podcast, the Friendship Onion, is food and Lord of the Rings trivia. What more do you want? It's I'm food and Lord of the Rings trivia. I'm thrilled. So, I'm just thrilled. So, so yeah, guys, check out check out the Friendship Onion. So we, for sure. I got a note from God, Billy last week, said you know saying uh, you know because I asked Billy how can we support this most, and he said he said the number one thing you can do is rate it five stars on Apple Podcasts. So where or or Spotify Podcast. That's right. Rate you it listen, five stars. You, to your podcast, look up the Friendship Onion. Give it five stars. Give every episode five stars. This, that's what the algorithms want. They want good reviews. They, yes. they kind of want subscribers. Of course you're going to listen to it. But five stars is the thing. So, guys, and remember, when they were here, yes. re remember when the chat room said, right here, at city, sit it at this bar. Yeah, actually where you're sitting right now. You are sitting in Dominic in Monaghan's seat right now. Actually, the chat room said, "Sing us a song, and we'll give it five stars." Well, guys, 
they gave us a song, didn't they? They gave us, <laughs> they gave us the Hobbit drinking song. Not the, not it comes from the Green Dragon, but the other Hobbit drinking song. Ha ha ha! It was perfect. It was it so went, perfect. We got we got the Hobbits. What a, it was what? hilarious. That, it you was know hilarious. what that felt having Billy and Dom. It was hilarious. Sing Hobbit songs in Scum and Villainy. That felt like the official end of the pandemic. You know, I'm, it really did. I, you know, you know, you remarked on that, but you were actually saying what I was thinking in that moment. You really were, Justin. You were thinking what I was thinking, and you said it first. It felt like the people assembled were willing to obey the, the simplicity of 50% capacity here, and everyone was following the rules and allowed to actually get together, all these vaccinated people, and get together for the first time in a long, long, long time in, in what could only be collectively called the spirit of a very humanistic moment. It was, it was a real shared moment of good, uh, uh, uplifting energy, the type you would get from the Lord of the Rings itself. It, it was very, it was, it was a stroke of, uh, of humanity, really. There was That's something right. to it. There was really something that simple to it. That's Just right. the, the fact that we could be together in celebration and safely gather and for them to celebrate the launch of their new endeavor. And I wish those two gentlemen all the best, of course, in this endeavor. It's going to be fantastic. Yeah, so so everyone watching Onion. today, after this show <laughs> ends, you're going to go rate it five We're stars. Rate because it five they gave us, stars. They gave us everything that we wanted. every episode. Oh, my gosh. They, they gave us everything we that wanted. That video will live forever. <laughs> that video will live forever. It was so good to have them. And I want to say thank you again. Personally, I know you guys are still there. Uh, Dom and Billy, thank you kindly for joining us and talking to all the folks right. and being part of our show. Well, it, was, it was a crazy night. Cliff, it was wonderful, wonderful. Uh, Cliff, people in the chat room, Julia in the chat room says last week was a can reunion show. And I was so nervous. Indeed, you. I was so nervous, and I, I, I you know, lost myself in I the conversation. I want to ask you. It was great. What did you, what did you think of that can reunion? We had an amazing oh. conversation. Oh wow, I loved that. I loved, and you know, the insights that were on display there, about these, <laughs> these early times when they didn't, they, they knew they had magic on their hands at New Line. The people had to convince everybody else. This wasn't just your garden variety, you know. This wasn't just going to be some, you know, run of the mill, you know, m movie. Yeah. This was going to be something else entirely. And they knew it. And they decided to really go for it. How great was it to hear from like variety? Like, like, yes. it, 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 literally for entertainment, it is the New York Times of entertainment. It is the gray lady of daily, daily variety. Da daily variety. Even, and even in those old, old cartoon shorts from the 50s. Bugs Bunny is reading Daily Variety. You know, when he wakes up, his, he reads Daily Variety. Yeah. It's <laughs> when he wakes up and has his first rat, you know, carrot, it's like, you know, looking for, looking for jobs. Kermit was told by Dom DeLuise in the swamp, look, it's in Daily Variety. They're casting frogs. <laughs> you know? That's right. It's, it, everything is around, anything in the entertainment business it's reported through Daily Variety, and to have uh, to have him there with the guys uh, from behind the scenes who who actually R Richard has the best Richard, story. Richard <laughs> Taylor really had his no. He was like a kid showing off his f greatest little artistic things that he had made to the world for the first time, because these people at the Cannes Film Festival had not seen these giant trolls and these costumes and these weapons, and he was just the wow factor that Richard was able to bring to that wow. was great stuff. I love it. It was, it was really good. Uh, hey, before we start talking about Ian McKellen's 82nd birthday, Cliff. No way. I have breaking news. He's going to do it right again, now. folks. He has I breaking news. breaking news. I haven't told Cliff what this is. Oh, jeez. Here I haven't go. told Cliff okay. what this is. So, <sighs> Cliff, uh, uh. I, everyone wants to see your reaction at this breaking no, news. No, what is this? This okay. is huge. This is huge. Oh, gosh. What is it? Are you I guys ready in the chat? Hold on. Wait, wait. Let me guess. Is this a casting announcement or is this a production crew announcement? This is huge. 
This is huge. Wait a minute. Do I need to get a glass of water first? I've got a, I got a stein of beer no, right no, here. No, 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 no. Hold on, right. hold on, hold All on, right. hold on. Wait a minute. Why do you do this to me? We're live on the air. We're trying to talk about Ian McKellen's birthday, and then suddenly... Okay. And suddenly... All right, here it is. Ready? Okay. Breaking news. This just came across my desk. September 2nd, 2021. September 2nd of this year. Um, September 2nd of this year. September 2 on this calendar. For the first time ever. For yes. The first time ever. Yes. J.R.R. Tolkien's final writings on Middle Earth will be published for the very first time. Really? Christopher Tolkien personally collected them, collected really? the unpublished final notes of the final six months of J.R.R. Tolkien's life, final notes on Middle Earth, and he has sent that to an editor named Carl Hofstetter. I know that name. And and they have they are publishing it September second. Wow. The first, the very last, wow. the very last word wow. on the nature of Middle Earth. And that's what the book is called, The Nature of Middle Earth. Wow. The very last of Tolkien's posthumous writings. Official canon from the From the end of his life. Himself. From the very last period of his life. That's right. Wow, it's publishing news. That's huge. That's that's amazing. I didn't know that beyond Christopher Tolkien's last publishing effort. This was it. Th this is it. This was which Chris was the the tale of, which was the tale of Baron and Luthien. That and was that, that, but but that was a reformatting of you know the tale of Baron and Luthien using the extendable. And then notes there was there stuff. was the, the fall of Gondolin. That's right. Okay. okay. But th th this this the, is the not a retelling of stories. This book is not narrative. It is called The Nature of Middle Earth, and it is Tolkien's final opinions and thoughts on what Middle Earth is, wow. where, and where the storytelling that should go. That sounds really, 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 really super cool. That sounds extremely, it, extremely cool. It lays the groundwork. So, so the, man, this is huge. His Let, final thoughts what does on this Middle Earth. Mean? What does this mean for the first season of Amazon series? If if no one has seen these writings before, what does this mean for the well, you know, season one that is about to wrap? I think you're going to talk about the evolutionary process of writing from this point forward. And we're going to have to be honest about it. And we're going to be intellectually honest about this as well. Because at, at the time when he was alive, Professor Tolkien also said a lot. He had much to say about the process of writing and how it evolved. And we know from existing publications of, of, of his manuscripts that were early and then shown to be written later and others that were shown to be written even later in his life, we have all seen through Christopher Tolkien's efforts a continuous evolutionary process in the way that Tolkien thought about his own writing. Thus, there was a second edition of The Hobbit, where, uh, as we've spoken of many, many times, and other Tolkien authorship has s spoken of, you know, the, the famous chapter of the riddles in the dark was rewritten and rehashed and recreated to fall more in alignment with what his publishing plans were for The Lord of the Rings itself which was hot in his hands and ready to... And, and ready and, and, and so the Hobbit had to be up, updated. And so, so he updated the Hobbit so before the, Lord but, of the Rings came but out, but he also Other updated evolutionary ideas updated, including his ideas of flat Earth versus a round Earth concept. Mm -hmm. That he revisited, which... What, you know, what about the renaming the Blue Wizards? Renaming the Blue Wizards and recasting his mind to what effectiveness the Blue Wizards had in various states of the later tales of the Third Age. Yes, he, he evolved over and Palando over and over again. Is not the real and now, name anymore. This, this new book, I'm sure, at least in comparison with what it means for Amazon Studios and their writer's room, back to your question, it means that everyone's going to be looking at an evolutionary process. This new book means we get to look at the tail end of Tolkien's life and get the very last glimpses of his thoughts on Middle Earth, the sh as it's called, the shape of Middle Earth. Nature. The, the nature. nature. The nature of Middle Earth. Okay. The nature of Middle Earth. That sounds like a fascinating. I'm obviously going to get a copy of that right away. But if you line it all up and line all your ducks in a row, we might be able to see after looking at season one, 
what the writers might change and how the writers might evolve at Amazon Studios for season two after they get some of this energy out on the page and get some of this stuff you know, produced and they get to step back and look at it and we all get to step back and look at it and then they might actually revisit it and evolve in, their own, in the writer's room at the show will also have to face that state of things changing and evolving the way that Tolkien did himself. People just joining that's us in the chat, Jewel, I know that's a Elena, loose comparison, uh, but a bunch it's of, honest. There's a bunch of people in the chat that missed the news. Here's the breaking news that just came across our desk. It isn't, September it's exciting. September 2nd. Very exciting news. September 2nd of this year, the final word on Middle Earth from Tolkien himself, the final so writings at the end of his life, the final 12 months of his life, J.R.R. Tolkien, um, the final thought on Middle Earth. The, and it's the book is called The Nature of Middle Earth. These are being published for the very first time. This is J.R.R. Tolkien's final thoughts on Middle Earth, the nature of Middle Earth, the nature of storytelling, um, the, uh, the, the pillars, as he liked to describe, he laid the foundation and he set up the pillars and the structures and the rules. And he anticipated and expected other minds to wield paint and drama to expand these stories. That was his early ambition. That was his earliest ambition that he self-corrected later in his life. But then again... But, it, then, but then he sold the movie rights anticipating that paint and drama. Uh, yeah, anti yes, anticipating cash or kudos. <laughs> Either cash or kudos, as the chapter in the book says. Um, look, okay, it's quite a story. To break the news, thank you for breaking surprising yes, if news. If you Google it, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, you know, I'm pleased. not behind the scenes today, so I can't show you the picture of the cover, but if you Google <laughs> the <laughs> nature of Middle Earth, this is breaking news, September 2nd, pre-order it now. It'll be available same day in the U.S., you know, the U.K., and Brazil. It is exciting news, and it's still kind of cute that he does that to me. It's still kind of cute that you Dude, surprise me word. on the air with things that I didn't the know. The final I love word that. of Middle it's Earth. It's cute. Tolkien's the final, final word on Middle, Middle Earth. Earth. Now, we'll get to compare the earliest writings to his latest writings. And that might give us a much, much, you know, bit bigger prism of thought to look at the way th some of his ideas evolved. But uh, so wait, so I, I, wait, wait. Think that I think that I have my own preferences. Obviously, if we're going to talk about the introduction of the Blue Wizards into this Amazon TV series, then it should be anticipated with some foreknowledge and all the Tolkien fans should agree that, that the writers at Amazon are getting the chance to use some of Tolkien's later, hopefully, hopefully they got a license to use Tolkien's later materials where it fits into the chronology and these characters are much more heroic and successful in their efforts against Melkor or the, the, the old effects of Melkor left in the continental wide range of Melkor's influence around people that Sauron could then later influence when the time comes for this f time frame of story that we're going to see in this new TV series. So how, if, if how does do it, this new book... Then we should know the difference. How does this new book affect Amazon's billion dollar Lord of the Rings series? We don't know yet until we see what's in the book. Well, wh but here's what we do know. If we also don't know if they're going to like get to license. Uh, it, it depends. Well, well, we do know Amazon we extending the reach of their have, legal they have rights they, they, to they, licensing stuff. They have licensed access to this. So, um, how do you on, know on that already? On the, wow, that's on the exciting. Very on the very first announcement of the Amazon deal, before they had hired a production crew, before they had hired showrunners, before there were rumors. Of, of young Aragorn before they went to the second age when the deal was announced that the rights to television had been acquired by Amazon. Yeah. They made a big deal. They made a big point to say that the Tolkien estate has review approval of the scripts and the Tolkien estate has made available notes and resources and pages to the producers because to craft because the overarching story. Because Christopher Tolkien was no longer there. He had retired from the position mm -hmm. of guardianship, and then he passed away. And with Christopher Tolkien not there after that, that's why this deal was made. All right, we want to be super, super, super clear on that. It was a new deal. 
with whole new terms. And so that might include additional notes and manuscripts. So the expectation is the Tolkien estate knew that because Christopher Tolkien put this new book of his father's writings in into production, into right. editing before right. he died. So the Tolkien right. estate knew that this book was going to come out. Okay. So it so is of course quite yes. pos it is quite possible that they shared uh, specific pieces of this with the production to say these are Tolkien's final thoughts on the nature of Middle Earth. Okay. If you're gonna, if you're gonna create okay. ten, 10 years, That's five seasons, okay. fifty episodes, fifty hours of Middle Earth, these are the rules. If, if, if this is true, then it might have a very, very specific effect on what the writers' room is doing right now. We're gonna have to have a peek at this new book. And see exactly what materials are in it. However, do you do you think that I, the, the, I want my my I, I mean we're having a we're having a legal conversation as much as we're having a creative conversation. What the creatives are allowed to do is bound by what rights they legally have to do. When Christopher Tolkien stepped aside, and then obviously later when he passed on, may he forever rest in peace. After all of his hard work, which was there was no just longer last year. a strict draconian guardianship over these materials, as there always had been traditionally. Everybody needs to know this, that Christopher held a rather draconian control and always was the person in the room who first said no. When they asked for rights to something, he was the one who always said no. You can't have the rights to what my father wrote. So do you think... When this all changed, the, the game really, really, really changed... Perhaps to a shocking degree, layers and layers deeper than we ever previously thought. Perhaps. We'll see, but we don't know for sure. But that extra added thing that you said, that they have script approval, was also seismic news, because that doesn't usually happen when an intellectual property is purchased by a movie studio to get produced. And they said... It doesn't and they usually said, happen. And, and they said the Tolkien Especially estate with will post make posthumously, available... Posthumously controlled IP. That's right. That and, and they said for Amazon, the Tolkien estate will make available extra resources on a case-by-case -case basis. Right. So if they... Ca basically, they, basically, they said if... If Amazon comes back to the Tolkien estate with a great plan, it's like, hey, this is a show we want to make. These are the characters and locations that we want to use. Can we play in this timeline? Can we play with these characters? And it's uh, the Tolkien estate has refusal rights to say, you know what? No, no Melkor. That's unprecedented, but if true, and if it holds true, then it might be a litmus test. It might be a final litmus test. Well, that works in the favor of the fandom, we don't know for sure. But we still, I would like to see this new publication because I would love to know any of Professor Tolkien's thoughts that were later in his life about Arda, uh, this secondary world that he created. I w wouldn't we all? Of course, we would love to know more. Let me ask you this. But you, I can't yet, yet predict. I can't predict yet how it will affect the TV show except by basis of comparison where they have some look a look at the perspective of how he thought about things evolved over time. Do you think Tolkien got darker later in life? And do you think this uh, these writings might not be as full of hope? Do you mean would some of would some of Tolkien's pessimism have creaked into his creeped into his later work? It might be the reason why he wrote a later fourth age story, The Return of the Shadow, and started writing some bits of it. You can get your hands on it in the History of Middle Earth series. Uh, some of these chapters that he visited, but he didn't find much interest in it, perhaps because it was not, because it was a little bit darker and pessimistic, and maybe because he didn't feel he wanted to write what that story was evolving into. So, Prentice, Prentice Toynard says, I'm pretty sure Tolkien did create some dark stuff. Let me tell you, Prentice. He sure did. Not only did he go dark, he, he, he said, I can't publish this. He went way dark and self edited that. That didn't he didn't he write some stories that he was just like going down a dark path in the fourth age? Well, yeah, he didn't he that's the, what I was just mentioning. He he actually wrote some stuff that is called The Return of the Shadow, and it visits with uh some of the young lads in Gondor 
and the son of uh, you know, uh, prin- uh, you know, uh, King Elisar, who we know as Aragorn, and uh, you know the kids growing up y- after years and years of peace in Gondor that makes them bored, and with the boredom sets in an interest in orc cults. Yes, that would be orc hyphen cults, like you know jo- Jonestown, like cults of of humans and being interested in orcs and. And, bol- and, and all sorts but of... And, th- then, and then Professor Tolkien admitted that he lost interest in writing that type of a story. It got too dark. He, I, I don't know if that's what he said. I have to look at, the, at what he the, said. The encouraging but, uh, thing about the publication date he, of he, this book... It just wasn't his flavor, I think. Again, September 2nd, The Nature of Middle-Earth, J.R.R. Tolkien's final thoughts on, on the nature of the world that he created as a, the sub-creator... The interesting thing is, Cliff, as we just yeah, discussed... J- James is correct in, in pointing out in the chat that it just became a mere thriller. Yeah. It just became a, a thriller. And, you know, if you've, you've read Professor... All his writings contain darkness, yes. Yeah, but th- it was true. balanced with uh, an element of hope. You know, yeah, it, it was... The strength of Tolkien is that he was equal parts hope and equal parts darkness. And it was the, that juxtaposition. And there's some great... Great essays by Ursula Le Guin and many other very, very well-read writers Mm -hmm. that point out that every single character has a light side and a dark side. And the whole book is juxtaposing, you know, the the light and the dark of Smeagol and Gollum, the light and the dark of of the ring's influence on Frodo, the light and the dark like this, you know, of... It does Galadriel take the ring and choose darkness? Does Gandalf take the ring and choose darkness? You know, the, it, every single character has an internal struggle wi- with where to go. But anyway, back to ba- back to my publishing point: the 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 the, the nature of Middle Earth. Um, J.R.R. Tolkien's final thoughts on the Legendarium is being published September second. Now, Cliff, we just talked about how Amazon and the Tolkien estate are working very closely on this show. This is not, they didn't sell the house off and, and Tolkien estate might get mad at the show. No, they're involved. They're involved all the way to the end. I can imagine. So I, 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 can know, I know it's a, an ongoing symbiotic relationship. It's a symbiotic relationship. I'm sure. So I can't imagine that the Tolkien estate would be publishing this book uh, against w- Without making against the materials the show. available? Wha- to the show, you mean? Not just making available, but I can't imagine they would publish this book if 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 there wasn't some sort of arrangement. You, like you don't want this book to immediately detract from the TV show, right? Well, it might be problematic if it immediately, you know, was in in contrast or opposition to what the show did. That might be very problematic indeed. Well, that's if, what if that's it, what I'm saying. If it is, if if the TV show. Is well, that's going to be an obvious statement. Let's get that said out front. If the TV show and the writers' room present anything that is antithetical or completely the, different from what Professor Tolkien would have done, and it is not in a, not really in alignment with what Tolkien would have written or done, then they're going to get called out on it right away. Regardless, we have lots and lots of existing manuscripts. We have mountains of existing literary legacy with Tolkien opining on the nature of many things in his secondary creation in, in, in Arda. Uh, and a lot of that stuff is delicious and found in the many volumes of the History of Middle Earth series. I'm dying to read this new book that you've mentioned today so that I can get my teeth into it and find out what they really have uncovered and what some of these last, un- as you said, previously unpublished thoughts and manuscripts were from the professor. I'm really intrigued to know exactly what it is Well, that's before, the before I make a further assessment on how it's going to boil things down on Amazon's TV series. We have, we have yet to see... That's the breaking... We have yet to see many things, uh, oh speculation man. Final thought, uh, final thought on, on, on this new book, The Nature of Middle Earth, <laughs> which you, you should pre-order because every book of Tolkien has sold out, every soundtrack has sold out. That's like true. You it's do want to pre-order this. Isn't that it's amazing? Tolkien's final thoughts on the nature of Middle Earth, that's the name of the book. Um, my final thought is, I believe, I believe, I don't know, but I believe that the Tolkien estate has shared these materials with the creative team at Amazon. I believe that the Tolkien estate 
has done that to ensure that the legacy of the professor and his wishes are held true to in the TV show. And I, I think the Tolkien estate is, is involved and engaged on such an important level now that they would make sure that that everything is just working together and, and you know, they don't want to ruin the TV show by publishing a book that says, I hope there's never a TV show about this. Like, they wouldn't do that, you know? Well, but but th it, it then will be then true to Tolkien. There never was much hope, Pippin. <laughs> just a fool's hope. And that brings us back to Sir Ian McKellen's big Sir birthday. Sir Ian McKellen. Big birthday, happy birthday, 82-year-old handsome lad. So, you, so Sir Ian McKellen, how you doing? Happy birthday from the one ring.net. Happy birthday to you, Sir Ian, from me, Clifford, from Justin, from all the founders of the one ring.net. And after 20 plus years of covering the fandom, we say well done. You are well forever done. our you are our very own Gandalf forever cuz you're the best the bestest Gandalf ever in the history of ever. So and you know. I'm I'm now it's official. I just want to remark that <laughs> he is stupid. 82. I'm being stupid now. He obviously. is 82, which means he was <laughs> 62 when Lord of the Rings came out. And can you imagine turning 60 and having a oh second God. career as Magneto and as Gandalf? It like, was like, like, like so like joyful. We were working with him on McKellen.com, and most of our attention was about his James Whale performance. Which was, uh, you know, in that film, Gods and Monsters. And there were wonderful actors, Lynn Redgrave and. Uh, was uh, what, was Brendan Ian. Fraser in that movie? And Brendan Fraser right. was, was the lead. L Opposite oh, Brendan Fraser, he's a hero to. Brendan us all. Fraser did not know that he would be cast in the Mummy movies. Brendan Fraser at the time didn't know what the future would hold. Uh, Ren. Miss Ms. Redgrave did not know that she was going to win the Oscar for her performance in Gods and Monsters. And the, uh, the writer, director, Bill Condon, no one knew what the Oscar campaign was going to lead to, but Sir Ian had, we were working on the, on the Oscar campaign on his website at mckellen.com. Nobody had any idea at the time he was going to get cast as Magneto and in the same breath in the same breath of time, in the same nanosecond, be cast as Gandalf at the same time. We didn't know that. Yeah. We were very much talking all about the James Whale conversation and his performance just in Gods and Monsters. And that was all of our energy, all of our calories were burning on that. Keith Stern, bless his heart, who is the webmaster of McKellen.com, he was burning the midnight oil. Um, they were setting up some great new uh, technology from the first time that the internet had done any live video streaming that had never happened before, there was no concept of doing any live video like that on the internet 20 years ago. And um, Keith Stern was spearheading all these great innovations for Ian, um, and had this wonderful website going, which was chronicling the stage life and the stage career and the burgeoning film career of other independent films and, and British films that Ian McKellen had starred in. He had also won the Tony Award for playing Salieri uh, in Amadeus. One it, of your favorite movies of all time. One of the best films of all time. Because it was... Favorite. My, uh, and it is my favorite. Uh, Amadeus is my favorite film. Uh, but that stage performance from Amadeus that was so famous, uh -huh. it wasn't F. Murray Abraham. It was you, Sir Ian McKellen. It was your Salieri that took the world by storm. That got the Bef Tony. Yeah, bef yeah, before F. Murray Abraham came on wow. board and won the Oscar for the role, which uh, always makes me wonder, I guess Ian was busy doing something else and he didn't get to star in the film that uh, Milos Forman That's directed. Right. Yeah. And that was the guy who had done, who worked with Jack Nicholson on One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. It's important. It was Milos Forman. Isn't that the same director? Yes. That's the same, and guess who produced it? Saul Zenz. Producer of Amadeus, pro producer of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. What was Saul Zentz doing in the 70s? Making cartoons. Making The Lord of the Rings with Ralph Bakshi. So it's all tied together magically. The whole Amadeus conversation has to necessarily bring in Saul Zentz. 
just yes. as much as it brings in Ian McKellen. But you can't wish a happy birthday to Ian McKellen without looking at that period of time when we all got that phone call and realized that these two directors had cast Ian to play two of the biggest pop culture visible figures. Arguably, Gandalf was a bigger and more no recognizable first figure than Magneto. But to get Magneto at the same time, there was suddenly a production struggle between what they were filming in Vancouver and what they were filming down in New Zealand so that they could break apart the production schedule to accommodate Ian being on both mega blockbuster films, X-Men and The Lord of the Rings at the same you time. You know, we had a reunion That's here what happened. of the first, the start of production of Lord of the Rings. We had a reunion right here at this bar we had all of the department heads. We had uh, uh, Keith Stern, um, yeah. who was Ian McKellen's right-hand man assistant. Uh, the social webmaster. We yes. Webmaster. And we had Mark Ordesky sitting right yes. here. And they explained how, Mark explained how they were able to negotiate with Fox to, to work Gandalf into the production. It is. Yeah. And I'm, I'm agreeing with the live chat. The live chat on YouTube is saying that Amadeus is one of the greatest films, one of the best films of all time. And it yes. is. But it is, easily. It is one of the best films of so, all time. So to, so to Cliff's point, before yes. he was Magneto and before he was Gandalf, he was an extremely well-respected career Sh actor. Yes. He had been featured on TV shows in the 60s and 70s on the BBC talking about the craft of acting. And he was that he was that respected. He was in the Royal Shakespeare Company. He was in the Royal Shakespeare. He was winning yes. Tony Awards. This man yes. was, and to, to turn 60, and and, yeah. and this is before Sam Raimi's Spider-Man. He actually This is before Kevin Feige he, is he at played, Marvel. He played in a big movie with Arnold Schwarzenegger in the 80s called Last Action Hero. He played Death. That was in the 90s. Was it? Oh, wait. Yes. Was Last Action Hero in the early 90s? Yes. Am I bad? I'm bad. Well, that was he Ian was McKellen. He was also in the Da Vinci Code. Of well, but course that was he was in the Da Vinci Code, but that was after Gandalf. Yeah, with the worst after haircut in Tom Hanks' career. Um, but no, so but he was you know what? I'm sorry, but the, the Da Vinci Code is one of my guilty pleasures, and I love Ian McKellen in the Da Vinci Code. I l actually, I c I'm into that stuff. I love Da Vinci Code stuff because I don't know. <laughs> I don't know why. I just uh, it's a guilty pleasure, but I like it. Now, I now, do, now, I have now to admit, so, so, so Cliff. Here, here you are, admit. you're publishing some great, great material at theonering.net, which mm, is one are. of the biggest websites on the internet, as we discussed last week in our Can reunion. The founder of the One Ring said that we were in the Alexa top thousand or something uh, websites of the world, like alongside Yahoo, and this is before Google even existed. Like, we... Yeah. The One Ring was a destination. You were publishing s some great, uh, some great work. And how did you, how did you know when to not publish what you knew about about what Ian was doing as Gandalf? Well, we had conversations with Chris Parada and Tahanu, Erica Chalas, and uh, Zoanan, Mike. Uh, we had uh, lots of conversations on the internal side of the One Ring .net. As much as we had conversations with Gordon Patterson, who has been our guest on many a uh, uh, he was with us last week, the VP of marketing yes. at New Line Cinema. We literally had we had back and forth with the VP of marketing at New Line Cinema to make sure everything was cool, and sometimes we privately talked to people at Weta and directly had talked to some of the people there and just tried to figure it out and make sure everybody was cool without anybody getting burned or or anybody being you know compromised in any weird way, but. Um, one of the best workarounds that Keith Stern ever thought of in showing the world what Gandalf's costume looked like was the infamous silhouette on the asphalt. Remember the silhouette of Gandalf? Oh, he his just shadow? took a picture of his long shadow. It's just, and that was the first time the world realized what his pointy hat and his big, wide-brimmed hat looked like. And it, it actually stole the internet for a moment because it showed nothing at all and yet it revealed everything. And I still say to you, bravo to you, Ian McKellen and Keith, because that was a, a master stroke of awesomeness. Samantha to just show the silhouette of his 
hat and robes and on the, on the ground. That was brilliant. Hey, I appreciate great, Samantha watching great. from there in Australia. Thank you for watching. Uh, and you thank, congrats, you met David Wenham and Miran Miranda Otto oh, last the week most, the in most Australia. Lovely, they're the most lovely people. They're they're, they're, they're just they're people. beautiful people. Yes, they and are. they're lovely people. So so Cliff, there's okay, a yes. there, there's a lot of things happening. Like that was the internet 20 years ago. Nowadays, like everyone, I get I. There's so many websites that are true and untrue. Like, don't ever trust the hashtag show or we got this covered. Like, they, they, they just make up whole clock. But th 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 there's, this tr there's this trend now on people who are, are, who are breaking scoops. Like like we did twenty years ago. Right. Yes. Um, I've that, noticed. That, that they they not only want to tell you what the scoop is, mm -hmm. but they want to tell you how they got it. And oh yeah. I feel like that's yeah. the big difference between that time. So l let no. me ask you if Do if you know the biggest thing I would ever say twenty years ago was a little birdie landed on my windowsill and and gave me a little inside information, which is a playful play on words with an obvious chapter of the Hobbit. The Hobbit has chapter titles that everybody's memorized, and inside information is just, and me saying a little birdie landed on my windowsill is me saying that somebody at Weta had emailed me, but I would not out loud 20 years ago have said somebody at Weta emailed me. I would euphemistically say a little birdie landed on my window. And All right, so, so your work, that's you're what helping. I would say. You're helping I, I kept run those identities secret. I kept those channels of information secret but what for 20 years. Let, let me ask you this. That's what would have happened? Was. Like, here you are. You're, 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 you're working part-time. You're updating. You're helping Ian McKellen update his website. You're probably the one doing the, co the HTML and the typing. And we were, right? sen and we were sending out a l Yeah, we were actually running a, a database of T-shirts. He was selling McKellen T-shirts that had the Gandalf picture that he drew. You yeah. know, Ian, Ian is famous for hand drawing his Gandalf. And so we had a big, big t-shirt with puffy ink that was a Gandalf t-shirt that said Ian McKellen in the beard. So, so you had access to Ian McKellen. He's probably giving you updates and th you're probably thinking, I shouldn't publish this, I should pu publish this. What would have happened if, if you had outed yourself like, hey, I got this exclusive <laughs> scoop from the set of Lord of the Rings because I know Ian McKellen. W what would have happened? That would have ruined the trust of my relationship with everybody I worked with and the, uh, the people who I was, you know, volunteering for at the website wouldn't, you know, be able to uh, have the advantage anymore of me um, uh, having the good faith of any of the operating people within my circle anymore. It would and be ridiculous. And to be clear, these were leaks. It would be an absurd breakdown of these everything. These were leaks. Like, when we posted the shadow of Gandalf in the hat, like, these were leaks. The studio never confirmed it. That's true. So was there anybody on our chat rooms and message boards saying, this is fake, there's no way this is real? Or was there a more inherent trust in... In, in the rumors and the scoops that we were getting? Well, I thought that there was some, there was actually some blowback to take down the silhouette picture. <laughs> there was. Ian, you got us in trouble. If I'm not mistaken, <laughs> but e no, Ian published it first and we reproduced the news at, at theonering.net. Yeah. But I think there was some blowback about the, the picture of his silhouette because it revealed his whole costume design just in a silhouette, even though it didn't reveal anything at all. You didn't get to see a single piece of fabric in the picture. Mm -hmm. It was just a silhouette. Uh, but what, yeah, hey, what we're dealing with now is a whole different level of social platforms. Do you, a do whole you think different level of conversations th and that are going on now. But um, I still think that it's appropriate for a fan community w uh, website or any fan community online to behave in good faith and to behave professionally with their secret inside sources or whoever, so that you know, you can just everybody can just get the job done, <laughs> and <laughs> and everybody can be fine in the end, you know. <laughs> yeah, I think I think, <laughs> but uh, Cliff, one of the reasons we love Ian McKellen so much, not just because he played Gandalf perfectly, is because he 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 was a champion of of what was right, and um, you know nowadays, you know back back to this conversation, like nowadays. Uh, there's all of this talk about, you know, 
being true to Tolkien and fidelity to Tolkien and like of Tolkien would not have cast that person and Tolkien would not have cast that person in the Amazon show or whatever. But we heard these same arguments in 1999, 2000. I remember huge debates on our message boards. They should have never casted Ian McKellen as Gandalf. Tolkien was a Catholic. He would never, ever approve of a gay Gandalf. Well, it worked out fine, didn't it? But, but rather than he didn't avoid the conversation that right like like ga- like ian mckellen no ian did not avoid the conversation no he actually addressed the gay gandalf controversy uh with a a, a huge uh thing that he wrote published on mckellen.com it's t- still there i'm sure and uh it's it's interesting the uh the, the all these conversations recycle themselves a lot after other it's generations. It's the same arguments, and the arguments are invalid. They were invalid then, and they're still invalid. I don't know. Um, I don't know. It's weird. Do you, but, but here's the thing. If the actors of the Lord of the Rings show that are getting some, some heat unfairly posted anything like Ian would have posted now on their social, you know, they, they, it, would, it would just fan the flames and probably create more dialogue. But there was something about Ian's post yeah. about a gay Gandalf that was the final word. And why do you think Ian McKellen's final word had such the sh- had the strength it did? This is before the movies even came out. It was backed up by his performance. He was Oscar nominated for the Fellowship of the Ring, lest you know. He lost the Oscar to his good friend, Jim Broadbent, that year. Oh. But he, he was nominated for an Oscar. For his Gandalf was so flawless, nobody came for him again. Nobody came for him again after that point. So, uh, because his Gandalf was so perfect. Ian, we love you and happy birthday. Again, happy birthday from all the Tolkien fans and all the ringers worldwide. You know, like Our very best wishes to you on this magnificent birthday. And thank you again for the... The gift, the gift that keeps on giving your performances, not in three films, but thankfully in six films, your Gandalf was perfection everywhere. And thank you for that. Yeah, uh, so, so, you know, th- th- there's still this conversation that, uh, you know, violating traditional Catholic morality is anti-Tolkien, but, and uh, I- Ian's Gandalf did not do that. But... That was the argument. That was the debate. Like his presence in the movies uh, violated that morality. Now, at fast forward twenty years, and the that's, position that's, a, that's an interesting concept. That's the, a very interesting. But concept. here's the thing. But here's the thing. But morality is an ever changing thing because the position of the Catholic Church on this matter has evolved in the twenty years. Yeah, the Catholic the Catholic Church's official position has evolved on so many many things over the centuries of the Church's existence. It is not a permanent state; it's a liquid. Many things are a liquid state. Uh, even the Church acknowledging the presence of extraterrestrial life <laughs> is a new thing, but it's still a thing now, is it not? So you know, uh <laughs> but no, but yeah. The the presentation of uh, the written material that Peter did in six films was, at least for the Lord of the Rings films, really much more in alignment with, and and we're talking about, when people do talk about fidelity to Tolkien, there's a lot of different flags waving in that arena, Mm -hmm. but mostly the ones that we started waving in the first place were the ones that were attempting to keep the text in mind when looking at how an adaptation ends up being successful or not. How do you think a successful adaptation of Tolkien can even be talked about? Well, it has to be talked about with one major basis of comparison, how it stands up to the text, right? It's that simple. So therefore, that's where the fidelity to Tolkien concept came from, at least from my point of view, and why I've used that hashtag a lot. But in terms of what the writers want to do, reflecting Tolkien's larger fabric of hidden Catholicism, there was so much of his Catholic thought process behind the secondary creation. Professor Tolkien thought that that artistry of all that body of writing was to celebrate 
God and his spiritual relationship with his God in the Catholic sense was more manifest in his artwork, his writing, and how that artwork and its existence as an artistic body of work, a secondary world, has how a sub-creator can celebrate a major creator, if you understand. It Isn't was it about a sub-creation. Isn't it and true? That, he, that he, he fascinating idea is something that the writer's room at Amazon should pin on the wall and think about as like a hovercraft of an idea that is an umbrella over everything. Tolkien always they really should think the about title that. of creator really of should, Middle Earth. Yeah, as a sub-creator, because he thought the creation act... Creation is the act of God. Yes, and a sub-creation, what an artist can do as a sub-creator, is celebrating that act and is an honor of that. And that is not just a spiritual connection, it's an artistic and emotional and mental connection to what you create. And it is, I, I get that. I, it, even though I'm not Catholic at all, I totally celebrate and understand that idea of a creator and a sub-creator and this algorithm between the artist wanting to celebrate the divine. Mm -hmm. There are so many other artists who have encapsulated that in other ways, but there's something wonderful about the way J.R.R. Tolkien crystallizes that thought. It's about the artist celebrating what is divine. And I'm all about that. And, and, and if, if the writer's room in any TV show or any movie studio wants to get that right, then they, they need to pin that on the wall at the top of the storyboard and always remember that's what it was about for him. And with that alignment in place, it might help guide them in their efforts. It one, guide one would all. think. One would think. Well, it guide all. And you really... But that's just me. You really feel that Ian McKellen's performance as Gandalf is... Uh, Ian is an artist. And he is creating... Mm -hmm. He is creating that character, even though it's written down. Oh, Ian yeah, is, but, and, I, and, but he is not Ian, the creator of Gandalf. No, but Ian's Ian's creator of performance because he's so in control of his body and his voice and his eyes as a thespian. He is a master and the way, craftsman. And the way his, of his, his, his lips, like when he's trying to crack a smile, he's trying to remember. The, the way his <laughs> eyes tremble when somebody is suggesting something he doesn't like. It's just amazing how Ian McKellen is a master craftsman, an artist. That's right. And he's celebrating the divine in his own art as a thespian. And I, I give him all the credit in the world for that. You know, and, and, and to that point, that's why I think this book coming out... Mostly Shakespeare. His approach to what is most divine in performance, in performing arts, is classically Shakespeare. And that's where his heart is, of course. We can have a whole other conversation about... Uh, uh, Shakespeare was a business entity, not a man, and he had a whole team of writers. Oh, th there's, a, a, there's a whole that's a tin other hat, I, no, foil I hat. Can, I've read all the literature, conspiracy the theory. historical research on that's Shakespeare, conspiracy silly, and, and the, the 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 house he lived in, and how many people lived there, and the addresses. Uh, anyway, that's a different conversation. You know what? That's great. Hello, Ryan. Ryan in the chat says that I'm a Catholic and I love our Lord and Savior. Um, but Lord of the Rings is not a religious tale. That's true. Because That's right. Professor Tolkien literally says in his very own words, you can look at the Twitter account, uh, literally Tolkien, and you can see it for yourself. There's nothing in it that is deliberately political, religious, allegorical, nothing. It's just not, not there. That's right. It's not there. However, other stuff is very, very cleverly coded and woven into it in other ways and other constructs of the narrative and other things that are way not obvious. Not the way that not the way that C.S. Lewis obviously used oh, yeah. specific allegory characters over the head. to be like a very ham fisted allegory. Yeah. Bam. But anyways, I can, I, bless well, you, Jack Lewis. Here look, here's the uh, 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 according to the text, um, uh, Ralph Bakshi did a closer adherence to Aragorn or Strider than than Vigo did. Yeah, he but, did. Yeah. Um, look but at, anyway, look the best thing that this new book can do, the nature of Middle Earth, is prepare us fans for the next phase of Middle Earth. Indeed. And I think it sounds like the the brief description of the book, the nature of Middle Earth, is that is the intent of this book. It is Tolkien's final thoughts at the end of his life. His final thoughts on the on Middle Earth and the stories and the structures. 
And the best thing that this book can do, and one of the reasons I'm looking forward to it, is to prepare me, prepare you, prepare the fans mm-hmm. for the, the additional storytelling that is about to take place over the next 10 years because there are no written books, full written books exploring the Second Age. This is all unheralded territory with just the basic outlines. Indeed. And I, I, until we see what's in this volume... We don't know yet, but I'm excited to see more, especially because there's an understanding that we all have to share that Professor Tolkien did not have a cut and dried, simplified view of his own universe. And he kept changing. It kept evolving, and it kept evolving. And he got to the point where many of his notes and his manuscripts would not completely conflict with, but not completely match up with some of his previous versions of the stories. And that was what Christopher Tolkien did while he was alive. He pieced together so many hidden bits of paper to get the puzzle together so we could chronologically see where it all began, where the Silmarillion really began, and where it ended. Are only things you can discover by you looking at the later publications of Baron and Luthen, Luthien or the fall of Gondolin uh, recently. And, and if you really want to find out what a, a strange, different approach Tolkien was going to take, go look at the, the History of Middle-Earth series and look at The Return of the Shadow. That's right. That's it's really intriguing. That was the fourth, the fourth age story that he abandoned. And but if uh, you want to read something before uh, J.R.R. Tolkien's The Nature of Middle-Earth, the final word, the final notes and thoughts of his on Middle-Earth, if you want to read something before that, uh, earlier, late last year we talked to John Garth, who wrote The yes, World we did. the worlds of J.R.R. Tolkien. Oh, he's and great. He, he's he, great. His book talks about the direct real-world inspirations for the things in the story. And I can tell you, like people yes. think, people want to think that uh, J.R.R. Tolkien That's created from whole cloth the, this concept of the two towers and the, the political enemies of Rohan and Gondor and uh, everything like that. No, a lot of things are based on Tolkien's real world, just like paying, paying the tax man down at City Hall. Mm-hmm. John Garth does a great job of looking at J.R.R. Tolkien's actual personal history and the real world places he was the, in and the real world he was in that inspired him that and yeah. uh, that directly inspired what he put on the page and it was a constantly evolving thing. Cliff, it's great to see you. It I'm is great to see you I'm too. I'm glad we're Good here sir. at Scum and Villainy Cantina with our friend Grogu. Um, Grogu. It's great that everyone's here. We've got some amazing shows coming up. In fact, any, we any closing thoughts, Grogu? No, no, no he, he's trying thoughts. to force close the camera. In a few <laughs> weeks' time, <laughs> Cliff, force close the, uh, the it's camera. It's taken yes. me forever, funny. but I've That's located funny. the f- the found the four founders of the One Ring dot net. Oh, this is so exciting! We're actually getting the four original people who, who created built this thing, and created the, the One IRC Ring. The IRC chat, the message boards, the oh websites, gosh, the yes. posts. The takedown notices, the, the legal threats, the spy, the lawsuits, re- the spy the reports, and the mischief. Oh my gosh, what a great thing! So we've we're, we're, we're going to get the four founders together and talk about 20 years of the One Ring, all of the legal issues, all of the parties that you guys have been a part of. Our early ambitions of what it would be like to try and use the internet in an oddly new and fun way to bring a literary community together to see if they could survive what we didn't know what three films were going to be like. That's right. We just wanted to bring everyone together to celebrate Tolkien. Whether or not we were going to burn in flames together with Peter Jackson's films, or whether we would end up where we ended up, which was being uplifted and surprised by their grace and artistry in Peter Jackson's cinematic world. Not perfect, but a solid, solid solid adaptation of the Lord of the Rings. And that's all we can ask for moving forward. It was much more than we expected. What can we learn as a community in 2021? What can we learn from the past and how do we move forward? Yes, we're going to have more conversations as a community about what we are going to do moving forward. And you see, there's some people talking in the YouTube chat right now about what some of the the comments have been 
about the recent casting announcements and the new a series. There's a bunch of comments from people like there Matthew are. in the chat room and saying you know that he used to refresh the homepage of the One Ring waiting for the latest update. Waiting we for the latest news talk, and uh, talk about that process. We're, we're going to talk about this, and we're going to talk about exactly where the community will be in the future and how we're going to uplift one another and we're going to understand one another as Tolkien fans better and we'll do our best to siphon the news from the rumors to separate the wheat from the chaff. We will do our best here at the one ring.net as and we've we always done. And we still won't reveal our sources. And and <laughs> guess we're what? We're still breaking news. We're still all volunteers. None of us have ever gotten paid. Never. And still never will we get just paid. Like we just the community. We really and love, we love the reason we keep doing the show is the chat room. J.R.R. Tolkien. I so love much. seeing the regulars in the chat know. room. I love new people joining in. You Me can too. follow, like, subscribe. Hit that subscribe button Absolutely. on YouTube. And if you missed any of our recent shows, again, the Symphony Orchestra reunion, the execu the producer reunion from Cannes Film Festival, the Billy and Don reunion where they sang Hobbit songs from the cantina. The father and son interview with Vigo and Henry Mortensen. Oh my gosh. We All the great things. You want to watch those things? Find those archives on our YouTube channel where you can subscribe to our YouTube That's channel. so much in the it's last just few like, weeks. You know, type in The One Ring, all one word. Or try typing in the One Ring Net, all one word, and see what you get on YouTube. All right. You'll Thank probably you, find Thank you, everybody. Us. This is Torn Tuesday from Scum and Villainy. That's Justin. That's Cliff. And you can follow me online at QuickBeam2000 on Instagram and on Twitter. And uh, of great interest to all of us, take a look at um, that fun little account, Literally Tolkien, on Twitter. They're doing some interesting stuff. And you know what? Next week... We're going to have quite another big show for you. Until then, we say good night, everyone, and good luck, or buenas noches y buena suerte.